somewhat uh, perplexing to people from outside. It's something that appears to be almost non-Jewish, this primacy of the role of the tzaddik in the spiritual life of the individual more than um, most of the other Hasidic rebbe's. And I want to emphasize this because I want to say without quite saying it that Rabbi Nachman surely understood his own role in the unfolding of Moshiach in the world. Rabbi Nachman constantly talks about the true tzaddik, the level of Moshe, till now. One time somebody came to Rabbi Nachman's student, Rabbi Nachman, and he said to him, so uh, who is the true tzaddik? And Rav Nassim said to him, Paroi was wiser than you are because after Joseph explained to Paroi the interpretation of the dream, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, and told Paroi exactly what to do, Paroi says to Joseph, since you know all this, there's nobody as wise and understanding as you are. If you know these levels, you must be the guy. Joseph had said, find some wise man to put Egypt in order. And Joseph says, to, uh, Pharaoh says to uh, Joseph, you're the guy because you know all this stuff. And so too, Reb Nachman must be the guy because he knows all this stuff. Well now, Reb Nachman was living at a time of revolution in the whole world. His lifetime spanned the American Declaration of Independence in 772. That was the year that he was born. His lifetime included the uh, Roman Declaration of Independence for given ignorant British from 76. He was four years old at the time of the Declaration of Independence. The French Revolution came along in his youth. He was in Israel when Napoleon was campaigning in Israel. Napoleon was spreading havoc across Europe and the Middle East, and everything was in ferment. In the years of Rav Nachman's uh, life, from the year 1772, when he was born, until the year 1795, when he was, uh, what, 23, the entire jury of what became known as the Jewish Pale of Settlement changed hands from the Kingdom of Poland to the Empire of Russia. That was a very important and significant change because historically the Jews of Poland had enjoyed a certain religious liberty. The Russians had no intention of letting them continue with this liberty. They were determined to knock Judaism out of the Jews. Anybody who thinks that the communists were innovators in this area does not know the history of the cruelty with which the Tsarist government wanted to and did recruit by force Jewish boys seven, eight, nine years old to the army for stints of 25 years of army service among non-Jewish soldiers of the coarsest, lowest type. The Russians introduced forcible secular education for Jews. They wanted to force, force the Jews to abandon their ancestral costumes, their ancestral appearance, to shave off their beards, to cut off their pears, to take off their kapotas, to wear the clothes of, eight, of 19th century Europe, to speak the languages of 19th century Europe, German, Russian, French, but not Yiddish and not Hebrew. And this enormous cultural assault on the Jews was going on in Rabbi Nachman's lifetime. He was deeply involved in this, and he clearly saw that the world was going through absolute uh, storm winds of change. Those of you who are familiar with Rabbi Nachman's story of the prayer leader, the 12th of the 13th stories, know that the storm wind just uh, blows up the whole world, throws everything in confusion, and this seems on one level to be a metaphor for the storm wind that was blowing across the world and bringing the Jews from their ancestral religion 
to atheism, to skepticism, to European philosophy, Greek philosophy, uh, later philosophy, to nihilism, to what led to to assimilation, to Bolshevism, to communism, to uh, to Freudianism, to uh, to all the isms of the 20th century, and to the dire situation we find today, when uh, compared with the uh, the the early 1800s, when the majority of Jews were Shema Torah and mitzvahs, and a tiny minority were making uh, their journeys to assimilation. Today, it's completely flipped over. And the true Shema Torah, according to Shulchan Aruch of Shabbos and the other mitzvahs, are a tiny minority, and other groups have taken over. And Rav Nachman surely, uh, in the Torahs he gave, which were not only for those who were present, but for those who were to come, the generations who were to come, clearly saw his messianic mission and the messianic mission of his Torah. Which story did you hear you? Which story from Rabbi Nachman deals with the world right? The prayer leader, the twelfth story, the prayer leader. So now, very important to the subject of tonight's talk is what happened in the year 1805, over a year before the narrative about the Megillat Starim, the secret scroll, begins. In the year 1805, Reb Nachman had his first boy child, Shlomo Ephraim. The Rebbe already had some daughters, but he had no son, and it's clear from all the accounts we have of his life that the Rebbe was absolutely certain and convinced that his son was going to come and complete the redemption. The very name, Shlomo Ephraim, that the Rebbe gave to his son joins together two very important things. Shlomo HaMelech not only built the Beis HaMikdash, of course, but was also from the tribe of Judah, the son of David HaMelech, and the, uh, the king of all Israel before the horrendous split of the ten tribes from Judah. It was in the generation after Shlomo, in the reign of Shlomo's son, Rechav Am, that Yeravam ben Nevat, the leader of the tribe of Ephraim and the leader of the ten tribes who followed Ephraim, rebelled against Shlomo, causing the fissure in our history that we are still living with today. The assimilation that we have today of identifying Jews who a few generations were Jewish and are now scarcely identified at all is small change compared with the loss of the ten tribes who have become assimilated with the nations of the world to the point that uh, nobody knows where they are. Maybe today this is changing. There are many who say they are members of the ten tribes in Africa, in Asia, in India, in Pakistan, in South America, in North America, in many parts of the world. There are people who are identifying as the ten tribes, but the, the name of Shlomo Ephraim joins back Shlomo HaMelech, builder of the temple, king from the tribe of Judah, with Ephraim, the representative of the Ten Tribes, and the very name of Shlomo Ephraim alludes to complete the Ula. And the Rebbe spoke in the highest terms about this son that was born to him. And in the early summer of the year 806, the baby died. And this sent the Rebbe into the depths of grief of brokenheartedness and in the summer that followed it's clear that the Rebbe knew that he had to make a complete reversal of his pathway. It was in the summer of that year, in the year 1806, that the Rebbe began telling his stories. When he started with his long stories, the 13 stories, he started off in that year, 1806, with The Lost Princess. He said, I tried to teach you Torah. It hasn't worked. Now I have to take you on a completely new 